Hey, Nick Nenton here, and thanks for tuning in to Now to Next. I want to make sure you don't miss a single episode of this show on YouTube. So before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You'll have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, just go into your settings and switch on notifications. Thanks for watching. Hey everybody, Nick Nanton here, and welcome to my next episode of Now to Next. I have got another really fun guest for you here. I'm going to read you just a couple of paragraphs of his bio, because he has quite a long one. I've been accused of the same, so I can't get after him. But let me read you a little bit about our guest here. Are you searching for graceful messages to soothe your weary soul? Are you craving gentle insights that whisk you beyond challenges and obstacles? Are you longing for someone pious to take you by the hand? and lead you to enlightenment. If so, then please do yourself an epic favor and stay the hell away from Steve Sims. In a world loaded with self-described motivational gurus who are far, far more interested in your cash than they are in your consciousness, Steve refuses to compromise his principles, which include telling the truth the only way he knows how, directly, blatantly, fearlessly, and with no holds barred, delivering visionary insights that are deeply rooted in pragmatic reality and practical action because it's all about results, and sharing everything he knows about being successful on a professional and personal level, right down to the last grisly intimate oh wow did he really just say that detail i'm gonna give you just a couple more paragraphs because it's too good not to read it what you see (laughs) is what you get many speakers who claim to be onions i.e wrapped in mystical and magical layers of enigmatic meaning have their metaphors mixed up because they're typical nothing they're typically nothing but smoke and mirrors get too close and it's all style and no substance steve ain't no onion what you see is what you get and what you see and get is a man who'd probably avoid making eye contact with an alley or anywhere else for that matter after all a shaved head harley davidson garb and body piercings on a 5 foot 11 240 pound frame don't scream let's be friends but that's the irony of it all because despite his gruff exterior steve is remarkably open engaging generous intuitive insightful and competent and he's leveraged all this to build a remarkably successful entrepreneurial career and i'm excited to bring on my good friend mr steve sims how's it going man and I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, that's one of the better bios I have seen. Uh, well done there. Uh, we're going to dig right in. Obviously, everyone can hopefully tell uh, you are not from uh, the United States of America. You've got quite the accent. You grew up in the UK and you started out as a bricklayer. Now, tell me about that experience because I've had a few manual labor experiences, but not for a long period of time. Well, um, I didn't know any different. You know, I left school at the age of 15. My dad let me have one day laying in and then the following day kicked to bed at four o'clock in the morning and said, right, you're on the building site. So it wasn't like I went through like the career department of my school. We, we sure as hell didn't have any of that. Um, I just left school at the age of 15 and was like, eh. and before I knew it, I was on a building site and I was on that building site for probably a couple of years. I'd always done summers and holidays on the building site so for me it was no different and I literally thought this is it you know and it was that period you know in 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 the 80s that generational period where you were told you get in and you work your way up through the ranks and eventually you'll get a a job and then you'll be able to retire that was what we was convinced and if you think about it and I'm older than you the word entrepreneur now and hustler is revered if someone came into your office today and went hey I'm, an, I'm a hustler and I'm the best entrepreneur you're going to meet. You've employed them. But back then, being an entrepreneur and a hustler, that was a bad thing. You know, you were you were basically stealing car audios and selling them at the back of the pub. So people used to uh, accuse me of being a hustler or an entrepreneur because I couldn't settle. I didn't know what I wanted to do. And who does at that age? I totally get that. It's funny. Uh, when I... F- had worked with Brian Tracy for maybe three or four years. Uh, we were at a cocktail party and he walks up, uh, to my business partner, Jack. And, and he says to us, he goes, you know, we're just alike. The three of us were just some good old fashioned hustlers. And I was like, you know, and and it was true. Just guys who were just working their hardest. And, but you couldn't have said that 20, 30 years ago. It it would mean again, you're, you're hustling someone. It's a, it's, it's a, you know, that funny, it's funny you say that. As I say, I, I grew up in a, in a you know, rough area of London, and I, I don't know what I had done, but I had got in trouble somehow in school. And um, I had been sent to the headmaster to get a cane. 
you know, and that was where they, they caned you. You opened up the palm of your hand and then they gave you three smacks with a cane and it made your hand sting. On the second cane, he said to me, you're nothing but a hustler, Sims. And the funny thing was, I never felt the pain for that or the following whack because I was like, why is that a bad thing? Why is that a bad term? And it, it's funny. We've all got these pivots and these moments in our life to make us go, oh, I'm going to do that. That was the moment that I was like, why is this? And I didn't think I was wrong. I thought the headmaster of the school was um, uneducated to actually use that term. And it was startling. It was so funny that in the middle of something painful, I, I, I mentally pivoted and shifted and went, yeah, I am. Um, and it's a good thing. Why are you such a, an idiot to think it's not? So funny that that should come up. I, I love that. And there's there's so much there. I'm, I'm, first of all, not at all shocked that you got a caning in school. My, <laughs> my, my dad and my grandfather's the whole, you know, my parents were from the island. So the British system, caning. I mean, they got, my grandfather, I think, had the record for the most canings, which I'm sure you're shocked <laughs> by as well. But it's, there's a couple fascinating things in there. Uh, number one, uh, a hustler really is just someone who engages in the act of hustling like you are working hard trying hard all those things and that's what it meant yeah. to you but the thing i love about this when i work through people's brands with them um I, people always say hey what's the big deal what's the big secret look we both know you could spend as many numbers with a zero behind it as you want on brands and brand consultants or whatever but what i tell everyone is a brand is nothing more than a story and branding is nothing more than storytelling and a great brand is a story that others want to tell for you right so when we look to create our brand, actually, if we're just being ourselves, our brand's being created for us. Let's just get that out there for a second. But when we yep. look back in our moments in our life, and if you're willing to comb through five to 10 of the most influential events in your life, uh, both positive and negative, and you're willing to look at those, you will see that by the mere fact that you remember them all these years later, like subconsciously, that story has been in your subconscious your entire life. And that's actually a huge turning point of who you are, because if it wasn't, you just, you wouldn't remember it. And so it's just interesting sort of digging into those, those little points. Now, leaving school at 15, um, that's interesting. Was that, was that acceptable? Was that just what everyone into your family did? Did you just hate school? What was the deal there? So the, the, the British schooling system is different to um, the American schooling system. O levels and, and A levels? Well, yeah, we had the O's and A's and, you know, we would leave school. You'd leave school at 16 and then you would go to college. OK, and then from college, you'd go to university. Um, so our kind of school and college is your mixture of kind of high school okay, uh, yeah. period. But I was very, very young. I was born in July. Um, and so I was the youngest person of my year. So whereas everyone else was 16 when they were leaving school, some of them nudging on to 17, I was 15 years old. So I was very young, very immature. And because of that, never thought about college, never had any vision of what I wanted to do. And my, my Irish family owned a construction firm. So there was no, no thought process. And of course, we never had Instagram to tell us how inadequate our lives were. And, you know, how that person over there has one of those cars that we can never afford. We never had any of that. So I never knew the word Ferrari. It had never left my lips. I'd never, I never knew the words Audemars Piguet or, you know, Mandarin Orient. And we never knew those things. In fact, when I say that we were working class, and it hurts me to say, and I have to correct it quickly, but in my later teens, I got very resentful for how poor I was. And it wasn't until my early 20s that I realized I was financially restricted, but I was incredibly wealthy because I was being taught to keep my word. I was getting up at six o'clock in the morning, working my ass off until 8.30 at night. I know what hard work is. Now, hey, we all want to work smarter, but when we need to work hard, some of us are incapable of doing it. I'm not. So... I was I was realizing in my early 20s, as this hustle was starting to grow, how competent I was to work hard, value my bond, value my credibility. And you talk about branding. I never cared. I, it was one of these things. I grew my brand by not caring about my brand. 
And I just became the ugly thug looking guy in the corner that could make shit happen. My brand was built for me. Um, and then, as you say, when people start spreading the word, if someone says something about you and introduces you into the conversation, you're already walking in with credibility, regardless of what you look like. So it was funny that uh, we my first takeaway was on my 18th birthday. Up until that date, we had never, ever taken food. Um, we'd never had food delivered to us. And I remember when I met my wife, uh, Claire, who's you know my, my anniversary of 33 years this Friday, um, we went to an Indian restaurant. And, and to say that my family's like a thick-headed Irish family, my mum said to me, ooh, why are you going to that ethnic restaurant? That's how, that's how she termed it. Why are you going to that ethnic restaurant? You know, not Indian, ethnic. It was just weird. But that was the kind of mentality that I came from. So two things happened, which I didn't realize. One of them, it wasn't a case of I was held back. It was a case of I wasn't introduced to anything. So I never had my eyes open to what was possible. I got three kids now, and they've done everything from bloody horse riding, water skiing, shooting guns, unarmed, uh, you know, judo, karate. You know, you try to get your kids to do as many experiences as possible so they grow their education. I didn't have that. But at the same time, something else occurred, which actually ended up being my secret source. I wasn't scared of anything because I'd never experienced it. So I wasn't scared of talking to the rich people. I wasn't scared of walking to someone, up to someone that was powerful and going, hey, how did this happen for you? I had no fear. I was a five-year-old kid. In fact, my wife says I'm a 55-year-old, five-year-old. I will literally go forward, and she's always said that my superhero power has been the power of ignorance. It hasn't frightened me. And forget intelligence and education. Can you imagine what you would achieve today if you weren't scared of trying? It's uh, that that was that was my few, that was my beginnings. Uh, I, I love that. Now, you. So first of all, we need to mention you do have an amazing book called Blue Fishing. It's been out a couple of years now. I was just late to the party. Uh, I had a big stack I was getting through. But uh, everyone, you got to check out the book. It is amazing. It does go through all the stories in full depth. But one of the stories from the book that I love is you, you were sort of walking with your mom, I believe, and she – you saw a purse or she saw a purse and she said, uh -huh. you said, Oh mom, don't you, why don't you want something? You should get that. And she, she made a comment that had a huge impact on the way you think. Tell us that story. So Saturday afternoon, me mum would kind of like wander me around like London and we would walk up all the expensive neighborhoods and the expensive shop. We never, ever bought anything, but she would uh, specialize Saturday afternoon, me and her window shopping. And we were walking up Bond Street, which is the same as kind of like Fifth Avenue. And every country's got this street, you know, like Rodeo Drive that's got all the big brands in it. And we're walking up Bond Street. And on the opposite side of the road was Gucci. And funny, the Gucci store has never moved. So I've been back there many times. And it's always kind of like kind of irritated me a little bit and created a trigger. But. We were on the opposite side of the road, and my mum is looking, kind of stretching her neck at a handbag in the window display. And she's kind of like doing all this. And I went to walk on, and she's like, hang on a minute, I'm looking. And she was looking for the, from the other side of the road on a crowded Saturday afternoon into the window of Gucci. So as she said, I'm looking at this. And I went, oh, okay, then naturally assumed she wanted to go in and get a closer look. So I stepped off the path to cross the road. And I was holding her hand at the time. I was only a kid. She yanked me back. Now, my first thought was that there was a car coming or something. Um, but on Saturdays, they, they didn't used to allow the cars to go up the street. So I know that couldn't be it. But I, it kind of startled me back. And I'm like, what? You know, wondering what was putting me in danger that she would pull me back. And she said, um, she said what are you doing? I said, well, I thought we were going in. And she said, no, 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 we don't go in there. That's for other people. And I couldn't fathom. Again, that's where the ignorance came in. It was a handbag. If you've got enough money to afford it, where does other people come into it? If you've got the money, buy the damn bag. It made no sense to me. But somehow in her head, I saw a restricted mindset. I saw my mum suddenly... In a, in, in a box that she 
had built herself and she wasn't allowed to step out of. And it was very upsetting. And when I left the bricklaying world and went on my journey to try and find where I could, and I ended up traveling around the world and all these kind of things, one of the thing, one of the companies I ended up working with was Ferrari. And I actually came back to England. And one of the perks, and you know this, I don't drive a car. I have 12 motorcycles and I'm always on two wheel. I don't own a car. Quite happy about that. But Ferrari's deal was every time I land in a different country, go to the headquarters and borrow a car. All right? I never wanted to do it. And sometimes I would get it, take it back to wherever I was staying, and just leave it there for three days, ride around on a motorbike, and then drop it back on the way to the airport. But this time I got the car and I took it down to my parents. And I thought, my because I knew my dad always liked cars. My dad was over the moon. I forced him, almost had to get him into a headlock to drive this car. And he was like over the moon about it. And I had bought a Gucci wallet. And I, I remember how mum looked at these Gucci. And I bought a Gucci wallet to kind of like symbolize, hey, I can afford what I want. I'm, there is no other people. It's me. And we're all the same. That's what I felt. And I said to my mum, hey, look, you know, do you remember our little trip to? And she said, what's that? And I said, it's, it's my wallet. Of course, it's got G's all over it. I was like, it's my Gucci wallet, mum. And she was like, why would you spend money on that? And I'm like, well, you know, I just, okay, she's like, well, that's a waste of money. And she was all offended. The funny thing was she had allowed her parameters and her fences to hold her back. I allowed those fences to force me to go forward and to knock them down. And by doing so, when I went back to her and I tried to take her out to a really nice restaurant that was local to our town, she didn't want to go. She was so set in her way, she actually looked at me at bitterness. My relationship with my mum sadly was never very good once I left the building trade. And I think part of it is envy because I had conquered what she was terrified of. And even though I try to explain to her part of the reason I'm doing what I'm doing is because of the fear you had and how I didn't want that fear. So you're the catalyst for getting me where I am. She, she never accepted it. It was very strange. And I've always, and you talk about Brandon, even when I'm coaching people now, I find the nine times out of 10, the first and largest problem of anybody is in their head. And it's strange how we actually do respond to it uh, and respond to inadequate people and comments. It's so true. Uh, one of our, my favorite Tony Robbins stories is, you know, as he's talking about, he, he's asking someone, well, why don't you want to do that? And it, essentially, and, it, and the stories for all of us, it's, well, they would say this, they would do this. And, and he says, who are they? And by the time you nail down the they, it's pretty much like the kid who bullied you in middle school and a family member or something. It's like, no, th- just get rid of the they. It's like the royal they. Just, just get rid of it. Like you don't, it, it's really like two people that are stuck in your head that are holding you back from achieving a ton of things that you want to achieve the you (laughs) you went from being a bricklayer and you got into the financial business uh it sends you overseas (laughs) and you end up becoming a club bouncer give us the the brief version of that because i love the story (laughs) of of how you made the the club sort of blow up uh in a good way not in a bomb sort of way (laughs) yeah my friend in london worked at a bank and told me that they were recruiting interns and did me a favor because i had actually saved him from a beating at school and so he actually kind of like repaid the favor by getting me an interview and i turned up with my dad's suit that was like about you know four inch off either shoulder it was it was horrible um but they were recruiting something like about 80 people to go over to hong kong to open up a new division and so somehow i got wrapped up in this group and got flown to hong kong to become a trainee stockbroker um i landed on the saturday got drunk with with them on a Saturday, I got drunk with them on a Sunday, went to orientation on the Monday, and I was fired on the Tuesday. They realized I had no clue what I was doing. And to, to say that it was the shortest career in finance is an understatement. Um, I probably think they spent the whole day just trying to work out which one of them was going to stand up to me and um, fire me after 24 hours. Um, but I ended up working in a nightclub. Quite simply, I was rolling around Wan Chai in Hong Kong, depressed. Where's my life going? Claire, my, 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 now my wife is in England 
And I'm thinking to myself, oh, my God, how am I going to tell her that I've just lost my job? Her parents had given me a couple of grand to help me on my way over there or to pay me to go away. I've never kind of worked out which <laughs> one. Um, and I was literally just kind of like, you know, trying to drown myself in whiskey at this dodgy nightclub. And um, this lady came out to me and she said, um, and it was funny. She said, your people in there. She said, uh, they are causing trouble. Uh, you get them out or I get them out. Now, bear in mind, I was drinking on my own, so I didn't know who your people was. And I went, well, what are you on about? And she said, you get your people out and I buy all your drinks. Now, the fact that I was going to try and kill myself with alcohol that night, I thought, oh, I'm going to take that deal. Um, so I went inside and there were three white guys at a table and they were obviously getting a bit lashed up and getting a bit loud. And she basically thought, well, you're both white, so you must know each other. <laughs> you know, So... Um, I diffused the situation. I just sat down to the guys and I said, look, I've just been asked to calm you down, get you to pay your bill and leave. Um, that's, that's it for me. I'm going to wait outside. Uh, and I said to him, you know, come back tomorrow and get a free beer. But if you don't do this, I've seen who's behind the curtain over there. And I just pointed to the curtain. There was no one behind there. I said, there's a bunch of guys there that's going to run out with sticks and you're not going to see Tuesday. I don't want that to happen to you guys. So please leave the fun and come back tomorrow and get a free beer. You know, I hope I hope you made the right choice. Good night. And I went back outside. My whiskey was still there, sat down. And the three guys walked out and they were like, thanks, man. I appreciate it. You know, thank you. So and I'm like, oh, you're welcome. And the woman came up to me and she went, you be dormant now. <laughs> and I went, she said, yeah, you work here. You work here. She said, um, I pay you and you can drink what you like. And again, I thought this is a great deal for me. So I went, OK, the second night, those buggers came back. And I turned around and I went, hey, you know, I sorted this out last night. They get uh, they get a free beer each. And she turned around and she said, you told them free beer. You buy them free beer. I had to buy them free beer and I'd only worked on my first night. <laughs> but the funny, thing, the funny thing was we all, as entrepreneurs, have the ability, and we're different to the other people. You know, we, we joke about them and us. We're the them, okay? And... Those entrepreneurs, we work out in our head, is this a bad situation or is this a good situation? Hopefully, we can recognize bad situations quickly. But how often have you found a bad situation that you've been able to tweak into a diamond situation? I found that I was very good at being a doorman, funny enough, by not having fights. I was really good at walking up to people when they're a bit lashed up. And if I walk up to you in a bar and I push you in the corner and I'm, you know, I'm picking on me and you, Nick, you know, you're re respectfully, you're smaller than me. Yes. Okay. I <laughs> if I, if I push you into a corner, physically into a corner, you've only got one way to go. And that's swinging back to me. Okay. Yep. So if you push anyone into a corner, no matter how big they are, you're only given them one choice, and that's to start fighting, okay? You don't want to fight. So if you can actually confront someone by giving them a way out while still keeping their manliness. So I would literally go up to people, big and small, and it was always funny when you give, you know, you'd do it to the smaller guys, and you'd go out there and go, look, you know, I've just been asked to, you know, to get you out of the club. You're having a bit of fun. You know, good for you, boys. I don't want to dance. You know, if, if you want to start slapping, I've got to start slapping. It's going to upset both of us. I don't want that. So could you do me a favor and, you know, please just, and I would just whisper this to them. And then they would be like, yeah, all right. Hey boys, we're going to leave. You know, I've decided we're going to leave. And if you gave them a way of getting out. And the funny thing is that can be conveyed in the business now. So I learned the art of negotiating from clubs. And you'd have this tiny little guy, like four foot five, kind of like making out as though he's just saved you from a smacking. And you'd be like, oh, thanks, man. Thanks. But it didn't bother me. I didn't care. So they started putting me into the more affluent nightclubs. And then this is where it started to happen. I was now on a soapbox where I could actually watch rich people come in and I could play the game. I want to be that guy. I don't want to be that guy. I want to be those guys. I don't want to be those guys. And you can tell just by the way the guy turns up in a car and like gives it a quick little rev before he turns it off, you know, looks at the valet boy as though he's scum and then looks around to everyone to make sure that they've seen him in his new rented car, you know? I didn't want to be that guy. 
but the cool guys that came over went, hello, mate, is it a good night tonight? And you just go, actually, it's a bit quiet. Come back in an hour. And they'd be like, oh, cheers. We're going to have a bit. And then it, those were the guys that I wanted to be. So more and more, I started playing the game. Who do I want to be? And then the next step was, what do I need to do for these guys to get me into the circle? Because you are the combination of the five people. Very boring cliche, but very accurate. Um, so I wanted to improve the five people around me so that it never ended up, as Tony says, those people, the they's, uh, they said, I wanted to get rid of those. I wanted to surround myself with people that were achievers. The way that I found out to do that was to tell them where all the best clubs were, where all the best parties were. And then before you know it, I started throwing the parties and then I started marketing other people's parties. And I went from throwing parties in back rooms of shady nightclubs in Wan Chai to, as you know, ended up working for like the Kentucky Derby, the Grammys and, and Sir Elton John's Oscar party. So it's uh, it, it kind of developed. <laughs> yeah, it, it certainly did. One of the, the lessons I love that you share there is about uh, a party with a password. And, and you have in, in your blue fishing playbook, you have uh, a rule that there's a password for every door. You just have to listen for it. So give us that brief story, because I think that's really you know a good one. Well, the easiest way is to, to, to create a smile, okay? So what we did was um, we didn't know how big a location we would ever have to rent, depending on how many came. So what we would do was we would send out – and here was the dumb thing. We never had emails at the time because this is in the 80s and 90s. We'd send out these faxes that there's a party Friday night at 8 o'clock. Friday afternoon, you'll get the password and location. So we made it sound all really secretive. But really what would happen is by the time Wednesday came along, if we'd have sold 100 tickets, we only needed a location big enough for 120 people. If we sold 200 tickets, we only needed something big enough for 250. So we would always do that. But what happened was we started sending out these passwords. So the first reason was it saved us on location. Like me and you know people to throw these events. And the first thing they do is book, they book a bloody 3,000 person event hall and then they're under the stress of selling it, you know? So I never wanted to do that. So I always sold and then got. Um, but then I would give them a password. And the password was always stupid because I wanted to work with people that were humble enough to have a bit of a giggle. So I used to say things like, the password is two of the Teletubbies. Or the password was, finish this sentence, one fish, two fish, red fish. So people would literally come up once we'd given them the location and they'd be like, tinky winky po. We'd be like, oh, go on in, man, you know, and we'd do that. But the funny thing was, was every time people would say that, they would get the reaction of you. You'd smile. So everyone walking through the door was always smiling. And you never, we never had one issue. And you'd get people walk up to the door. And I remember this one perfectly. It, we, we took over this yacht and there's a gangplank and me and my fellow meet Ed. We're at the bottom of this gangplank and there's a young girl checking off all the names, taking the passwords. The whole boat's going crazy behind us. There's a line of people. This was in Macau. There's a line of people waiting to get onto the boat. Everyone's looking good. Cars are pulling up, dropping people off. And this guy steps in. He's like, yeah, I'm here for the party. And she's like, oh, sorry. And she's, he says, yeah, I'm here for the party. You, know, you let me in. So I step forward and I'm like, sorry, you know, what's going on? He's like, I'm here for the party. And I look at my mate. Now, bear in mind, the boat behind us is swaying because of the party and the music. You can see the bloody thing going on as much as you could a bloody elephant. And I turned around to my mate and I went, hey, do you know where there's a party tonight? He's like, no. Is there a party going on? I said, well, this guy says there's a party going on. And we start having this conversation between us. He says there's a party. No, I don't know there's a party. It was a party last week. Maybe he's talking about, no, I don't think so. I think he's talking about a party. So we're completely blanking him and having a conversation between us. And then we're like, every now and then we would include him and go, but hang on, hang, hang on a minute. Let me ask, where's the party then? He's like, there's the party. He, 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 he thinks there's a party here. You know, is there a party? I don't think there's a party. Maybe the guy's a little bit funny. Is he high? I don't know. If, are you high? <laughs> yeah. And we were just, everyone behind him was finding this funny of course, this guy's getting more and more aggravated. And in the end, he walks off with his date. Okay. She, by the way, was having a giggle and believe it or not, came back alone. Okay. And wanted to get into the party. 
But everyone else after him would walk up and just go, bluefish. And we'd be like, in you go, mate. Have a good time. So we found... And again, this was a metaphor that I took with me all the way through my world. And you've worked with me many, many years. You, you know me. I've always made sure that if you focus on who you let through the door into your project, your company, your course, your inner circle, your party, whatever. If you control who walks through your front door, you remove 99% of the problems inside. So I always focused on my front door. If I could make sure that everyone was humble enough and smiley enough and good for a giggle, I removed 99% of my problems. We never, never, not once had anything worse than someone dropping a glass by accident. Never once. So that's, that's how that came about. And the, the, the funny thing was we then found that we were getting quite good at it in Asia. We launched a company. Uh, we called the company, and I don't know if you know this, it's not in the book, but we called the company Trianon. And do you know what Trianon is? I do not. Trianon is the court of the Greek gods. So when the Greek gods can't come to a decision, it goes to the final say in everything, and that's the Trianon. So... We came up with the most precocious name known to mankind, Trianon. We were the final say on all you know, nightlife and events. and We didn't even know what we were really doing at the time. So we were just, you know, we can do anything. We were the people that, you know, can kind of thing. But people would phone us up and go, hey, is that that blue fishing company, that blue fish company? And we'd be like, it's not. It's not. We're Trianon. And then they would hang up. And believe it or not, people, we were hanging up on people. They were hanging up on us. And it was the secretary, one of our assistants, that turned around and she said, you do know that you're that bluefish company, don't you? We're like, how are we? Your passwords. Because we were using like about three or four different passwords, we hadn't added up two and two and realized that people were thinking that that was us. We did a name change and we became bluefish. That's that's great. Uh, another one of your your tips that I love is uh, when you're talking to somebody, ask why at least three times. You know, if someone tells you they want something, want to do something, you typically would say why once. Uh, I'll let you fill everyone in why you think the importance is in three times. So people are scared. Um, and you know this better than everyone because you need to ask why so many times to be able to produce the fantastic work that you do. Um, but when you're talking to someone, you say to someone, hey, what do you want? You know, the first response you're going to get, if you said to someone, hey, you know, this weekend, if you could do anything, what would it be? They'd be like, oh, I'd have a hot tub with all the Hawaiian tropic girls and I'd have a fleet of Ferraris and I'd be on a private jet by that afternoon. And then you go, oh, that sounds great. What would you do the following month? And if you start drilling down and down and down, sooner or later, it'd be like, oh, I'd like to buy my mum a house and I'd like to work on the garden with her. So... When people first speak to you, they give you the response that they feel puts them in a good light. They also don't want to humiliate themselves by revealing the core of, of what they want. Now, we can both talk about a fellow friend of ours, uh, Dan Fitzpatrick. Um, Dan Fitzpatrick with the Joe Polish Genius Network Group. Got to give a shout out to Joe Polish. Um, you must. It's the, a rule. It's, it, it, he's made it a rule. He's made it a rule of the 20 feet. He's got a very low self-esteem. And so if, if you don't repeat Joe Polish a couple of times, he does. He will text us aggressively. Um, but uh, Dan Fitzpatrick was introduced to me. And in his words, I want to meet the rock band journey. And I said to him, what do you mean you want to meet him? I want to meet him. I want to shake their hand. And I'm not trying to belittle Dan, but it was a very weak request. So I said to him, why is it important to you? And he went, well, you know, they've, they've kind of been, been around my life for quite a long time. And, you know, they're a fantastic rock band. And again, giving me an answer that puts him in a smart, sensible light. So I went, okay, but that's the same for everyone. Why is it so important to you? And you get into your, you know, Chris Voss, midnight DJ voice. And eventually by asking why and why and why, he gave me the story 
of when he was at school, at college, he made money by sleeping on his mate's couch, but by performing in a Journey cover band as the lead singer. Now, he went from that into finance. He made money. He lost money. He was good in deals. He was bad in deals. In and out of relationships. Uh, was sick. Was well. Was sick. Basically, life. And through the ups and downs, he celebrated it with Journey tunes. And he encouraged himself to get out of the, out of the pit with Journey tunes. So, Journey was actually the theme tune to his movie. So, I said to him, okay, so Journey's been with you. All your life. And he's like, yep, they've been my theme tune. Anytime I've needed anything, Journey's been there to answer the questions and move me forward. I said, so you're telling me that going over and shaking their hand should be how this phenomenal movie ends? It's not kind of the ending, is it? And we got him thinking. Now, what we did was I always say, Never give people what they ask for. Give them what they lust for and desire for. It's different. If you give someone what they ask for, Amazon is building a program now to put you out of business. Okay? Yes. You, you don't believe me? Phone up Amazon and say, hey, you're thinking of changing the toilet roll. Which one should I buy next? There's no one you could do that to. Amazon re uh, respond to orders and transactions. Right. You should be responding to the needs, dreams, and desires. That's what makes you different. So I contacted Journey. I explained about this guy. Uh, we found out that Dan's brother's son has autism. The drummer's son has autism. So we were able to put this together, wrap it around raising awareness for Autism Speaks. And uh, Dan Fitzpatrick actually got to sing live on stage in San Diego four tunes as the shortest term lead singer of the band and then walk off stage with the guys, get some photographs. That was a great climax to the movie. So give people what they lust and desire for. And you're only going to get there by asking why. Why is that important? Why you? Why should we do it for you? Keep asking until you get down to something that you can work with. Absolutely. And we haven't even talked yet about the fact that you have had people have private dinners with Bocelli singing to two to three people like you've you've taken people down to the Titanic to have tea, uh, which is is I think it's on my list, but I think I might be a little claustrophobic. I, we got to talk through this at some point because I've heard some of the details of these submarines. But the you know, you you've been able to accomplish amazing feats. And I would say, honestly, um, there are a few people who uh, who have insane networks that I know I'm totally blessed to have one because every time I interview someone for a movie and I make them look great, they want to be my friend. So it's sort of like cheating. Um, Joe Polish <laughs> will give another mention insane network. You'd be the third person. I know. I think between the three of us, we could probably get to everybody. Uh, and yeah. I've, I've met a lot of people through Joe too. I, I will I readily admit, but you know, how do you, a lot of people want to know. So when I say like Tony Robbins will respond to an email, I just connected uh, Dick Vitale, the basketball, announcer and mark cuban together and because of what was going on uh mark donated half a million dollars to the, the the v foundation for childhood cancer research and it was just from one email right and i said by the way mark doesn't always answer my emails but he does sometimes and he did this time and it was good it worked out but people always want to know how do you get relationships like that how do you keep relationships like that i have a very distinct answer from my experience I, i'm wondering for you you have a relationship with Elton John. He wrote a testimonial for your book. People want to know because it seems like these people are magical unicorns. But how do you gain a relationship of someone uh, that famous? And let's just assume I'm going to put aside the the shallow uh, I don't want to make fun of influencers too much, but just people who, who gain Im desire influence for no reason. Let's talk about like super talented people. Let's put let's the Elton Johns of the world, the journeys of the world. People are really talented at what they do. How do you cultivate those relationships and how do you keep them? So it's it's uh, and you well, you know, the answer, you know, <laughs> the answer as you ask the question um, and you belittled yourself. Uh, you were very humble there, but it's not just one email that he would respond to because let's let's be serious you can go online and find mark cuban's email address you know you can go and find there's programs where you can find absolutely anyone's home telephone number yeah. and email address getting hold of the person is no longer the challenge the challenge is being so 
impactful and so much of a solution that they want to engage in uh, a conversation with you. Okay, that's the key element that's important now. Not getting your foot in the door, being welcomed in for coffee and cake. So when I have a relationship, the first thing before, and none of these happen flukely, okay? When I went and and got in in with the Elton John Foundation, I attacked that puppy. I did my homework. I knew what I wanted out of it. I knew what was in it for me. So I needed to look at how I could make it a win for them straight off the bat. I literally went up to the people that were behind the Elton John AIDS Foundation. I said, I really love your event, but you're losing thousands of dollars because it's not working right. It's not working synchly. And I've got about four steps where you can actually go. And I'm one of the guys who took it from a three and a half grand ticket to a seven and a half, ten and a half and 15 grand ticket. And they were like, that's not going to work. And I said, let's try it. If it doesn't work, what have you lost? We tried it and what I became a value proposition. Any of the relationships that you have, you need to be a value of. You know, I always say that selfishly, everyone in your group should make you better. Okay. I have people in my group that challenge me mentally. You know, why are you doing that? Why are you getting involved in this? I have people that can help me. Uh, with education, whether it be on starting a new business, raising capital, you know, whatever. I have other people that have no money, no business acumen, but they make me smile. They encourage me when I'm down and they tell me bad jokes. Every one of these people are there to benefit you. You have to work out to the person that you are talking to, how can I bring something of value to this party? And I've literally walked up to people and I've gone, hey, um, you don't know me. My name's Steve Sims. I always say that. And it's funny because it's obvious they don't know me, but it gets it out of the way, you know, because they may be sitting there going, have I met this guy before? Am I supposed to go, hey, it's good to see you again. If you walk up and go, hey, you don't know me. I'm Steve Sims. It relaxes them a little bit. And then you quickly turn around and go, hey, I know you're working on a project And I can't help thinking that you're missing the window on this opportunity from the project. Have you considered doing this? And I will throw that in quickly. Now, sometimes I've had people going, I haven't. Let me introduce you to Birdie and let's chat about it next week. That's fantastic. And then you go from there. I've also had people turn around and go, that's a great idea. Yes, we did think about it six months ago. And that's why we canceled the project six months ago. And you go, oh, okay. And they go, but hey, I like the way your brain thinks because it took us a year to get to that. Maybe if we'd have come to the party last year, we'd have saved ourselves six months. So would you be willing to look at another couple of projects? We look, yes, I would. Send them over to me. So you've always got to enter into any relationship with value. What do you bring to the table? Responding to people's emails that you get people to do is because you've brought value that they know that when they get an email from you, you're not just sending them an email going, hey, what's the weather like down there? You're bringing them someone of value to their world. And that's why people will answer your emails. And uh, thank you. And that is the secret. I I say everything in life is just an exchange of value. And and one of the things that so many people think it requires money. And that is such a misnomer. That's actually the hardest thing because it's the easiest thing to quantify, right? So if you ask someone what their speaking fee is, there's a number. But if you say, hey, if I were willing to do this for you, would you be willing to, and half the time, it won't cost you anything. And they'll get what they they want. I've I've had so much fun with taking things that have uh, a, a certain value and turning it into something that has a much greater value. I think you know the story. I bought a cigar that was half smoked by Winston Churchill, and I created the last 500 cigars on earth that you can share with Winston Churchill. We sprinkled some of the tobacco in 500 limited edition cigars. I just was filming at the Field of Dreams. I actually literally have a bag full of dirt that I pulled from the Field of Dreams in Iowa that I'm now going to figure out how. what am I going to do with this dirt to turn it into something that that it really brings nostalgia and inspiration and other things to people. But it, it's it's... The value is far greater in experiences and in, in, in feelings than it is in dollars. And I, I really wish people would find better ways uh, to, to realize that because most everyone goes straight to money, right? 
Oh, it's the easiest. The money is always the last conversation. I've, there's a couple of points here. If you if you want to connect with powerful people, the easiest way to get them to hang up is to utter the words, how much will it cost me to do X? No one wants to be a transaction. You, you know, you phone up Elton John and go, hey, how much will it cost me? He's going to hang up on you. Yeah. Okay. They want to know what's in it rather than what the payment is. They don't want to be treated like a prostitute. Okay. So that's the first way to do it. Secondly, if you are focused on discussing the price, that's because you fail to establish the value. So I have always gone, and none of my things, whether it be closing down museums for the dinner party in Bocelli, whether it be hanging out with Elton John, whether it be playing piano with Guns N' Roses or Guitar Was He, none of it started with monetary. Every single one of them started with, I have this, and I want you to be part of this story. And this is what the story looks like. And this is how it benefits you. This is the win. How can we make sure it's more beneficial to you once the client's got this? By working that kind of value proposition that works on both sides, you know there's going to be a financial swap somewhere down the line, but it should never be the leading conversation. I could not agree more. I'm going to see if – I'm probably not smart enough to do this, but there is a – you said something almost identical to uh, something I say an awful lot. Let's see if this comes up. Uh, I think, yeah, everyone should be able to see this now. It's a graphic that says price is only an issue when value is a mystery, and that's you know that's from, from years ago when I got interviewed about something. So I, I – I absolutely encourage that. The other thing that I, I actually was thinking about today prior to this conversation, we – we only – okay, so most people desire great success. The biggest problem is they forget the ingredient that is required for great success and a great return, which is great risk. Now, that risk does not have to be financial risk, by the way. Again, that's just a very common misnomer. But in order to, in order to play at that level, you know, it's, it's like elephant hunting. I mean, you, you ha- but you have, to, you have to take a shot. Right. And so one thing that I find that people miss out on all the time is they don't take, you know, there's oftentimes when you think about, man, I really would love to do a project with Richard Branson, right? A guy we, we both know who's also great at responding to emails when you give him something of value. And it's like, but how many people never send that email? Uh, I remember when I first met uh, uh, Jack Canfield and we've now done so much business together over the past decade. I made a documentary on him, all these things. And I, when I first met Jack, I mean, he's the co-author of Chicken Soup for the Soul. I mean, so, and even, this is, I met him 10 years ago now. It was an even bigger deal back then. It's still a huge deal. It's a global phenomenon. 500 million books sold. I was introduced to him by Larry Benet at his Sang event back in the day. And I met Jack yep. and we had a quick conversation. It sounded like there was something there. I, I went away and I emailed Jack like I was told to do and I never heard from him. I emailed him again, never heard from him. I emailed him again, Never heard, never heard from him. As our mutual friend Jay Abraham would say, most people would say, "Well, I tried everything," and and when in fact you've tried like two or three things and you it just didn't work. But how bad do you want it? And and again, what's your why? I wanted. I thought there was business to be done with Jack. I wanted to have a relationship with Jack. So here's what I did. I've told a lot of my clients a story. I got a camera. I had a friend of mine film with me me with a camera, I, and I filmed a video saying, "Jack, I've been calling you. I've been emailing you. All I'm trying to do is build a relationship." relationship with you and help grow your business. And it was like a two minute video. So I, so email me back, call me back. Here's all the info. I bought an iPad. I changed out the home, the lock screen. And I put on, I, I wrote on a legal pad and photographed and said, Jack slide the arrow this way. And it just said it had an arrow that way. Then I hid all the apps on the second page. And on the home page, it was videos. And I put a home page screen that I had handwritten on a yellow pad, Jack, push this one. And it had an arrow up to there. And then the inside he pushed it says, the video is called Jack, watch this. Now I sent it to him. I fed, I charged it up. I fed exit to him and I don't hear back for like a week, two weeks, three weeks. I'm starting to get frustrated. So I go to the next event where I know he and I are going to be. I walk up or I see him across the room. He's talking to somebody and Jack's a great guy. You know, this is Jackson. He's and yeah. so he sort of tells him, Oh, I'll be right back. And I see him, he see him walking towards me. I'm like, this is going to be good. He goes, Nick, Man, I got the iPad super clever. He said, I have actually been out of the country more than I've been in the country. Uh, and I felt so bad I was going to send the iPad back to you. 
However, my daughter really wanted an iPad, so I gave it to her. Call me next week, and we'll do business. And uh, and I did, and, and we've done millions of dollars together. But you know, it just takes <laughs> takes something unique, something again. In that case, I was trying to show him I could provide value, and it just took. It's a bit of a gimmick, but I spent four hundred dollars and overnight. Uh, overnight shipping to show him that I'm not just another leech saying, you know, just throwing anything at the wall saying, Hey Jack, look at me, look at me. Can we talk? Can we talk? And so I find that there's so few people who are willing to, you have to find every way you can to provide value first. And sometimes that's very difficult, especially if you can't have the conversation, but there are ways the iPad is just one simple one, but I mean, I'm sure you've done crazier things than that, but I love bringing value to the table and an entrepreneur. This is why, I love what I do. We uh, Dan Sullivan said this. Another men- we've got to name Dan Sullivan every podcast, or it's not complete. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Has <laughs> Joe, Joe Polish and Dan Sullivan every single time. Now we're good. Now we're good. And so we <laughs> said, uh, he said. Um, an entrepreneur is someone who always gives value before they ask for anything in return. And I find that that's, that's true in, in everything I do in life, but relationships is probably the most poignant. I, I never walk up to someone literally or figuratively with an attitude like you owe me something. I get so many emails a day. So do you people asking me for favors for this, that, or the other. I will go to any lunch. Someone invites me to, I'll go speak at any classroom to any kids that they're five years old. If they just ask nicely, for help. The moment someone says or has an attitude like I really owe them something, I just lose it. I can't do it because I, I, yeah. I know that from now you don't get it. So any place that I put you that you're going to be a referral for me, it's just going to reflect badly on me. So I'm out. I don't know if you have experiences like that. I'm sure you do. Yeah, we, look, we've all got those kind of people. And you, you, you say about the iPad, I was actually working in the Vatican uh, getting a couple married by the Pope. <laughs> and they actually gave me this, uh, they gave me this sister uh, that was my point person. And she had, I think, one of the first ever Motorola flip phones. And it would, it didn't sit right where she'd sat on it. And it was unhinged. And it would like, she'd have to carefully open it. And the reception was terrible. So once I knew that things were going to start happening, I was getting somewhere. Uh, from America, I bought an unblocked um, phone and uh, took it with me when I went to Rome the next time and gave her an iPhone. And here's the funny thing. It wasn't even the latest iPhone. It was the one before because I had to get it unblocked. Yep. And they weren't allowing the latest ones to get unblocked. I gave her this phone and it was, it was literally like I'd just given her heaven, you know, direct. And um, again, same thing. All apps on second screen onwards. And the only phone number pro- programmed in there in the favorites and on there already was mine and it was a big smiley face that whenever i phoned her this would come up and she would know it would be me and she'd be like hello steve you know it just it was hilarious she loved that phone there there are so many things you can do that have far greater impact than the monetary value you spend on them so for me people sometimes shudder like oh you'd spend four hundred dollars i'm like yeah i was willing to invest an iPad's worth of money in the hope that that relationship would work out because, and I did the same thing to Richard Branson. He didn't call me right back, but I did see him at an event. Actually, I went with Joe Polish. We shouldn't say his name. If we say it a third time, he's going to show up. So let's not do that. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, we can't do it. It's like Beetlejuice. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so, so I sent it to him, but I saw him at an event. He goes, you're the iPad guy, aren't you? And I said, yeah, he said, that was really clever. And we had a good conversation. Now Richard's been in, I don't know, three of my movies and other things like that. And so it is all about, as I interviewed my friend, Sally Hogshead earlier this week for my coaching group, different is better than better. And so there's so much you can unpack from that. Um, we only have a couple minutes left, but one thing I, I, one of your favorite tests that I, that I have is probably the only test I like in life. Um, you have a test called the chug test. Tell us about this. <laughs> so can I plug where people can see this? Absolutely. All right. So if you go to stevedsims.com, you can sign up for the newsletters, get the first newsletter, then click unsubscribe. I don't care. It's up to you. But the video that will pop up will say the chug test. And you can also join an Entrepreneur's Advantage Facebook group, and it's in there as well. But this came to me years ago, funny enough, when I was in a very dark place. Um, And again, I was drinking whiskey and I thought to myself, I don't want to surround my myself with people that I can't hang out with, that I can't be comfortable with. So, and this literally came to me in a dream. So I'm in, I'm in England. Now, funny enough, I was in Switzerland at the time when I was dreaming this, 
But in my dream, I was in a little village and I was walking up the high street. And on the opposite side of the road, with traffic coming up between us, was someone in my world. It was a client. It was a member of the staff. It was my accountant. It was a buddy of mine. Someone in my world was walking down the high street on the other side of the traffic. And did I, A, suddenly look in the shop window, pretend I'm interested in a new mattress while watching that reflection walk past before I walk, uh, look back and carry on walking, pretending as though I didn't see them? Or do I put my life in my hands, jump through two lanes of traffic to jump in front of them and go, Nick, hello, man, how you doing? Let's go chug a whiskey. Now, this purely simple dream came, and I woke up in the morning, and I thought to myself, would I have whiskey with my accountant? Would I have a drink with anyone in my office? Would I have a drink with all of my clients? And I literally started going through it, going, yes, yes no, no, no. And I got rid of them. And I went to the office and I said, okay, we're going to do this chug test. I've had this dream. And I told them all about it. And we started going through it. And then what would happen was everyone that would apply for membership, and we still do this now for our coaching. Once they filled in all the details, once we've both spoken to them before we accept them as a coach, a uh, coaching client, we literally chat with each other and we'll go, well, chug test. And one of us will go, yeah, I would. And if one of us goes, you know, I wouldn't. You know, it would be too much effort. You know, I wouldn't want to spend half hour having a whiskey with him. You know, we've got nothing in common. Right, like, hey, good, fine, done. It's a very, very, very simple test of making sure that you only have collaborators and creative disruptors in your world. And it's going to be tough because in that chug test, you may find your mum's in it. You may find a member of the family's in it. You may find um, a, a relative, an in-law, someone that you went to school. This is the worst one. When you actually, and you, you coach, so you know this, people surround themselves with people and it's not always the right people. And one of the common answers of the reason why they hang around with so many saps is uh, we've been friends since high school. Well, these guys are holding you back. They're not pushing you forward. So really, if you did not know those people, would you chug a beer with them? Would you sit down and have a beer with them? And if the answer is no, you need to have that conversation. And it's a tough conversation. Best treated like a Band-Aid. But get them out of your life. You'll be fine. Absolutely great. Uh, great advice. I love the chug test. And uh, if they are a relative of yours, you can use our friend Jack Canfield's rule. It calls them a CEO. Uh, it's a Christmas and Easter only. That's it. If you, if they're that's basically family. You can all that. You got to cut them out the rest of the time. But you you have to put up with them. Uh -huh. Christmas and Easter only. So excellent. Uh, SteveDSims.com. Uh, he shared a lot of other things. There's a ton more wisdom in the book Blue Fishing. Uh, Steve, thanks so much for coming on now to next. I really appreciate having you, and I will look forward to chugging a whiskey with you soon. Appreciate you, man. Be safe, and thanks for doing what you're doing. My pleasure. Take care. Hey, Nick Nanton here, and thanks for tuning in to Now to Next. I want to make sure you don't miss a single episode of this show on YouTube, so be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You'll have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, just go into your settings and switch on notifications. Thanks for watching.